We at ADN love to experiment, and again, this is a part of a, 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 a different way of wanting to uh, go into discussion. The, I guess the usual format would be a keynote followed by a discussion, but here we like to have larger groups as then we hear a polyphony of voices, opinions, and ideas. And with that in mind, welcome to the Critical Response Roundtable to our earlier keynote by Janet Pillay. Uh, how this works is that we have three speakers who will give sort of their personal response to uh, Janet's thoughts or to counter or to even prov put out a provocation. Uh, <laughs> Janet loves a good fight. She just said, yeah. Um, they each have about eight minutes and then what's going to happen is that we open it to a cross dialogue with all three of them, including Janet. So, um, make it a clean fight. Thank you very much. I would like to just uh, very quickly go into a round of quick introductions. Again, we have three very illustrious thinkers, doers, uh, from diverse fields. First, on my far right, there is Ness, who comes to us from Philippines. And she is writer, performer, dramaturg. A very small anecdote, we invited her, I think, was uh, the first, it was during the inaugural, wasn't it? Or was it the second one? And she was one of those who, one, after one panel, came up to us and said, Oh my God, I'm not alone anymore. You guys talk about dramaturgy. And that really encouraged us, actually. Uh, she comes from, again, a very uh, pedigree experience in performance of all sorts. Leading uh, one role is that she was one of the core member of this contemporary performance collective in Manila called Sipat Lawin. Uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar, I would indeed encourage you to talk to her about it. We do not have time to go into that or Google it. Uh, and then very quickly moving on, we have Ken Takiguchi, who is a familiar friend with ADN and a personal friend for many of us here. And Ken has taken on many roles, and he, one of his current roles at the moment is theatre manager of Setakaya Public Theatre in Tokyo, and also a part-time lecturer with Tokyo University of Arts. Uh, we know Ken as Ken, our friend, but more importantly, dramaturg, translator, and producer. Those of you who are interested in translation as a dramaturgical tool, please seek him out, and I'm sure he will talk about that in his response too. Last but not least, we have Felipe uh, Cervera, Mexican by birth, but has made Singapore his home. I always like to lead with that because it's, you know, uh, and he, work, he at the moment works at the National U. Oh, no, sorry, the LaSalle School of College of Arts, my mistake. I beg your pardon. <laughs> the mistake comes from the fact that we were classmates in National University of Singapore. Uh, but today he is here to respond, but also he has done other things, uh, not just being an actor, but recently taken on a lot of performance making roles. And as he said just now, by Janet's definition, there is a dramaturg in him yet. So without further ado, the order will be, I'd like Ken to start first on his little response, then we move on to Philippe, and then Ness will round it up, and then we can all join in the fight. Oh, sorry, Felipe will start first. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking ADN for finally inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mentioned this with, with pride because as uh, Hong Yan mentioned, Hong Yan and Miguel and I we were in the same batch of PhD students at the National University of Singapore. And Hong Kong graduated one year or two years before Miguel, and then I, Miguel graduated one year before me, so we're kind of like together. It was a very small cohort, but we were tied to each other. And um, I'm just very happy to be here because I've seen Hong Kong invest in this project for five years, and I've seen ADN grow. ADN has have to, to develop a presence in Southeast Asia, to be a, a node for 
scholarship on dramaturgy, so I'm very, very happy to be here, to be joining the conversation. Um, and, well, thank you to CIFA, thank you to Center 42. It's always great to join you guys and be among friends. Uh, so my, my response uh, has uh, three, I have three main thoughts responding to Janet's keynote. Um, the first one is proving a bit of a critical response, uh, a bit from the point of view of historiography and the historiography of, of dramaturgy as, 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 as a thing. Um, in that sense, what strikes me in the keynote is that the trajectory of the argument um, we've been speaking about decolonial and decolonization, decolonial thought, and so on, and the trajectory of the argument uses what seems to be a very canonical um, his history of Western theater as the epigenetics of dramaturgy. And so the trajectory of the argument is, this is Artaud, this is Brecht, this is Lessing, and these guys were spending some time doing theater, right, trying to understand how dramatic structures work, but if we move that concept to Asia, then it becomes something about development, right? So I'm, I'm sure that Janet didn't, like that trajectory is not, is not meant to put dramaturgy in Asia as a developmental tool instead of a, of a creative tool. But it's interesting to see how, uh, or just to have a moment of meta-analysis and be a bit more critical about the ways in which we write the history of dramaturgy. Um, how do we speak about dramaturgy is also dramaturgy, in other words. And in that sense, I think that um, Janet started by referencing her encounter with Schechner, and indeed, uh, the trajectory of the argument that she had was very Schechnerian in the sense that um, performance was, a, was kind of like a key concept to understand other cultures, right? So the encounter of the other. And if you just reflect back on the keynote, there was this sense of encountering the other as she spoke, right? Uh, how, how dramaturgy can be a mediator between lineages of performance making and lineages of society making in Southeast Asia. So I think that there's quite a bit to unpack um, in there, uh, trying to, obviously, in, 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 in the colonial tendencies, the first reaction is try to decenter the paradigm and try to remake a new paradigm, or in other words, to say, well, let's just forget about the Europeans and write the history from the point of view of Asia. And while that strategy may be generic in itself, it may be also uh, reactionary, right? So I guess that when we begin to unpack these historical trajectories of how we speak about dramaturgy, the point is not so much about finding what dramaturgy means in Asia, uh, or just Asia, but understand the relational ontologies that may define what dramaturgy is at any given point. Um, in that sense, I also think that we can spend some time talking about the performativity in and of the drama dramaturgical practices, right? Or, uh, and I'm, I'm using performativity here in, um, in in, in the Butlerian sense or in the Foucauldian sense, right? As a system of normativity of behavior. So once we begin to think about uh, the performativity in and of dramaturgy, the question is who can be a, drama a dramaturg, right? Who is allowed to be a dramaturg? And within the, the office of the dramaturg, what is allowed in the behavior of dramaturging, right? Also, bringing back all of these uh, also the reflection of the historiography of how do we talk about dramaturgy. So that's one, uh, my first big response. And it's, it's critical and it's also meta, right? It's about how do we begin to write histories of dramaturgy in Asia without falling in these binaries between East and West. That as, as, as Mark mentioned in the beginning, I thought that was brilliant. We need to move away of Asia as a definition because if we remain there, we're very much still in the paradigm of being the other, right? The, whatever is not European, right? So that's one. The second one, I think that in Janet's keynote, there was an, an unspoken non-human, and um, especially in, in reference to the example of shamanic practices and, and medicinal practices, not only in Southeast Asia, but in other cultures, right? Um, 
So the first question would be, do we dramaturg the non-human or the non-human dramaturgs us, right? But of course it's not as simple as that, just as how it's not about whether the West defines the East or the East defines the West, I think there's something to unpack also in the ways in which non-human agents and humans interact each other in dramaturgical processes. And by non-human, I'm referring here to obviously spirits and the divine, um, but also to technology, to weather, right? Um, to what extent, if, if the dramaturg is this bearer of this course, um, why should that bearing stay within the restrictions of the human body? And to what extent is technology also a bearer of this course of performativity, but also the weather, the climate, right? Uh, what are the affordances that we have in dramaturgy in, in this cursing theater? So the, I think that the non-human can also be a point of, of, of unpacking in, in, in Janet's keynote. And the last one, um, so I think the, the last bit of the keynote that we didn't hear, but it is, it is in, her, in her text that she very kindly circulated before so that slow people like me can catch up, um, is, is this aspect of political life, of, of, of media training, that I think is, 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 is paramount to what Janet is saying, to this notion of extended dramaturgy. Um, I'm always very fond of the fact that we in, in, in the arts tend to think that whenever we come up with a new role or we, ident or we put a name to, some, to a practice, we're innovating socially, but oftentimes we're, we're behind, right? And if we're going to understand dram the dramaturg as this extended figure, uh, the birth of television also came with the birth of the manipulation of reality, of what reality is, right? Marketing. Um, I was born, luckily or unluckily, into a TV family, and so I spent my formative years in TV studios. And my family, uh, all, all my, my, my father, my stepmother, my mother, my siblings, all of them do news, right? They produce news. And um, so oftentimes you, you tend to think that this, the creation of this course is some sort of paranoid android trip of how the media is manipulating you. But it doesn't take too much criticality to understand that the, 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 within a news producing team, there is a, a dramaturgical process of telling a story, right? And uh, a, close, a close example, and I mean, I, I mentioned my family because this is something that is always in my mind, right? How are news being distributed? And an example that is close to home right now that I find and also can be a point uh, connection to Janet is um, how um, the president of Singapore came to be president, right? How that announcement was mediated, was whether, whether it was a contested election or not, that's not to be discussed, right? How the announcement was made, that's a dramaturgical process that is um, perfect in as much as it was perfectly tailored to the spectator, right? So I think that there's something there about how we tend to think that dramaturgy is this area of practice within theater, but if we just expand a bit more, right? And we just think through the implications of what Janet is saying, we will find that whatever discussions we're having, in other areas of human practice, they're way far ahead, right? And this is really, you started your keynote with, manipulation of time and space, and this is exactly what is at stake um, in, in these cases. So those are my three points. The first one is the meta perspective of how we, we speak about dramaturgy. The second one is the interconnections between humans and non-humans in dramaturgical processes. And the third one is media training and marketing. I think that there's something there to be unpacked. Thanks. Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon. And um, um, my response is not a kind of a, a direct response to the, uh, uh, the Janet um, the keynote. Um, what I would like to try in this presentation is to um, recapture what the uh, Janet um, presented in her 
very extensive you know, notion of the, uh, uh, the dramaturgy and the dramaturg um, in her keynote, meaning that the, uh, I was really, you know, or the, uh, listening to her keynote, I was really overwhelmed with the, uh, the scope and the, also the uh, diversity of the role of the dramaturgs she presented. And the, uh, I wanted to recapture it into the practice of one particular dramaturg who is working in a very specific field of theater. So the, my practice is basically, you know, or the, um, um, in the field of so-called intercultural theater. Mark uh, this morning said this is a very controversial term and I, I would agree with that. But uh, uh, let me use this word, the intercultural theater. Um, so the, uh, I have been involved in almost only in that kind of, particular kind of theater, and uh, which typically involve the, uh, uh, the artists from plural countries and uh, involve you know, the, uh, several languages. And uh, uh, sometimes we have co-directors and co-writers. Um, so, um, so I am working in that kind of um, the, uh, project as a dramaturg. And uh, my role actually is really diverse, very different from project to project. But at the same time, my purpose or my aim has always been the same, to make the intercultural theater a kind of platform where the people um, interpret others and, uh, uh, and also themselves and uh, in a great diversity of idioms with expanded communication and the intercultural influence. And probably this is what Mikhail Bakhtin called uh, heteroglossia. So reflecting my practice, and I can category, categorize my roles as a dramaturg into some, into some. and uh, um, I just, because I have only eight minutes, right? And uh, I have, uh, the, I can elaborate only, only a couple of them, but I just uh, want to uh, try to uh, connect my roles, you know, um, that uh, I played in my practice to what Janet um, the pointed out in her uh, presentation. So the first role I want to highlight is uh, gap filler. The uh, dramaturg as a gap filler. The, uh, what I mean is that the, uh, Janet quoted Alto and uh, pointed out that encounter with the others would create a performance that would awaken the, uh, uh, the audience unconscious. And uh, I think that it is it is a very reason why we would like to do so-called intercultural theater projects. And uh, um, I believe this is a, usually a very basic motivation we have in, the, in these practices. And um, I, I realize that, you know, or that um, the encounter with the others really opening up the, you know, or the awaken the unconscious of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the audience, and also the creator's unconscious as well. So, the, uh, but in the process of the intercultural theater making, we can find a lot of gaps, you know, perception gaps on many, many different layer, levels. And uh, um, some gaps are very fundamental. You know, sometimes we, don't have a shared understanding on what we call intercultural or what we call collaboration. So I had a very bitter um, experience of that. The, uh, when I, the back in early 2000s, uh, when I pro uh, uh, produced a show, which is, uh, which is meant for the international collaboration between Japanese and the, uh, Malaysian um, the, uh, theater makers, and uh, uh, we previously had three-year workshop sessions. And uh, we didn't have any intention to make a production you know, at the end of the process. But yeah, everybody wanted to make it so that we did. So because of the three-year process, I assumed that you know, we are on the same page on the meaning of collaboration. But yeah, after you know, we studied the rehearsal, after one week, you know, the Malaysian performers called me and uh, we had a long discussion with them because they were very, very unsatisfied with the process. 
because it was not a collaboration for them. It was, they were directed by Japanese the, uh, choreographer. So for Japanese choreographer working, creating a piece with the, uh, the dancers who came from different cultural background is already a collaboration. But yeah, for, the, for the, uh, uh, the Malaysian performers, the collaboration is not meant for that. So there was a huge gap, which I, I didn't be aware of until that happened. So the, uh, it was a very bitter lesson I, I learned that you know, or the, we cannot take anything for granted. And uh, um, we really have to find, be sensitive about these gaps, and also we have to con constantly fill these gaps in the process of intercultural theater making. So the, um, so the uh, role of the uh, dramaturg in that kind of process can be a gap filler, you know, or the, uh, the, uh, the one who try to find these gaps and fill the gaps to set the ground for the uh, intercultural communication and collaboration. This is one. And the another thing is the two minutes, okay, context provider. And uh, I often take the position of translator um, in the intercultural projects. And, uh, but yeah, I sometimes feel very uncomfortable to take a position of the text provider. Rather, uh, I am more comfortable to take a position of context provider, you know, which I believe the main role of the, the, uh, the dramaturg. And uh, in the intercultural theater, of course, power relationship is always a big problem, especially uh, um, when the, uh, the Japan, the, it, it's a collaboration between Japan and the areas which was invaded by Imperial Japanese Army. You know, that this power relationship sensitivity is very, very important. And as a dramaturg, I really, you know, the, uh, have, had to struggle to set the ground for the uh, discussions among the, uh, uh, the collaborators and the, uh, the provide the information they, they need and also the perspectives, multiple perspectives, you know, that are to be considered. So the, um, one minute. Um, so I, I prepared the, the uh, uh, let me just quickly go through the uh, uh, talk about the uh, project we, we recently had, which is uh, the community-based theater project called Two Stories of the Community, which was a collaboration between the Singapore's The Necessary Stage and the, uh, our theater called the Setagaya Public Theater in Tokyo. And this is an uh, exchange project between the, uh, uh, the uh, community members of the, in Tokyo and in Singapore and the, uh, they exchange the, uh, the letters um, um, with the theme of family. So they talked a lot about their families, what are the challenges, what are the issues, what are the problems. And then the, uh, they, they uh, came up with their own story and they created the show. And that happened in March this year. And uh, uh, my role was very limited, very, very small. But still, I played uh, role of uh, context provider when we applied for the grant and uh, we, get, uh, we gave the grant makers the, uh, the context of the project and also at, 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 the, at the, uh, the presentation, I provided the context to the, uh, the audience to make it a more, <coughs> um, to let them get involved in the, uh, the discussions after the performance. And also, the, I, uh, I played the role of the gap filler in the process of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, exchange because their information and the perception gap was huge at the, at the very initial stage. And they didn't go you know, back and forth to, the, to each society. So the, uh, the role of the person in between was very important. So I feel that the, uh, we talked about the, uh, the roles of the dramaturgs, which was mostly the role to be in between. And this in-betweenness is the very key of the role of the, the uh, dramaturg, I think. And, uh, um, and probably the role I played in this particular project is not really a dramaturg. And I, my name was not credited as a dramaturg. However, whatever it is called, 
the role is there, the necessity is there, and this is the gap we have to fill, and this is a niche we have to, fill, we have to you know, order, uh, deal with, and uh, I believe that this is another aspect of the role of the dramaturg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I'll give you a, a minute to breathe before I start. Okay. <laughs> um, so going back to Janet's presentation earlier, um, what, what um, I'm going to share is actually my appreciation of the acknowledgement of the expanding definition of uh, dramaturgy or the role of the dramaturg um, because uh, I've, I was recently part of a project where I didn't think of myself as a dramaturg, nobody called me a dramaturg um, because it's not a performance work, it's, a, it's more of a visual arts thing. Um, so yes, and I was, it's a, it's a project of my husband and yes, I'm 27. Uh, I'm not very young. Uh, yes, so it's a project of my husband and he's a visual artist, he's a sculptor and it's a community-based project. Um, and I was first part of the project as a finance manager. Um, but it's just basically allocating the funds. Um, and when we went to the community, you know, there's not a lot of things to do because you're just, you know, giving out the funds for buying things and I had a lot of free time. So I found myself doing a lot of dramaturgical work. Um, and then I was, but then, but then I couldn't, I wouldn't acknowledge it as that because I was like, no, it's not a performance work. But then after um, hearing your talk and after, you know, reading, reading, what you wrote, I was like, no, actually, I, I was doing dramaturgical work. Um, yes, so, so I, I, this is you know, under the theme of expanding it, so it's not just in performance work, it's actually, uh, yes. So the, the work that we do is, uh, it's a participatory three-dimensional mapping where uh, we partner with uh, geographers uh, to get the GIS data of a, of a place and then um, uh, we do this participatory, it's called citizen science, so they actually, scientists also have this methodology, um, participatory methodology which they call citizen science, uh, where you teach uh, the community um, certain ways of doing, scientific ways of doing. Uh, so for example, uh, okay, so yeah, so as you can see there, this is uh, these are layers of um, uh, plywood and sawdust. Uh, that is an accurate um, uh, accurate representation of their um, community. So this is in an indigenous community in. Uh, northern central Luzon uh, in the Philippines and uh, we spend like maybe three weeks working with them um, to trace the data on the map and then cutting uh, the plywood and then putting it together and as you can imagine doing this work takes a lot of time so there's a lot of interaction within the days because you have to cut or you have to put the glue and there's like a long waiting time and what are we going to do with that time <laughs> so uh, in those moments we end up designing you know conversations facilitating a few sessions to talk about their community the issues in their in, uh, in their immediate environment and things like that so those are the things that i kind of ended up dramaturging i guess so this is uh, and we also did this in another um, in another area in the Philippines. It's an island. <clears throat> it's a very isolated island community. There it is. So and we actually ask them also to um, design uh, their own map. And what I what I find 
interesting um, in, in doing these kinds of works, why I think um, the, the, the language of being a dramaturg is useful for me when I go into communities, it's because I, I for example, I can't, I don't, or I wouldn't use the word directing a community, directing an interaction with them. It's more of, because that's a bit more controlling, and um, you know, to, to think of yourself as a dramaturg of this interaction uh, is a lot more open, uh, kinder. Um, yeah, because, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, yeah, so for this project, I would say my, my role was to design, design the time that we were spending together with them and design the interactions that we were having and being sensitive to, um, to the social actors uh, and agents in that situation. Because when you come in, there's a lot of things. There's the head of the village, there are the teachers, there are the barangay health workers, etc. And you have to navigate that, that, that interaction with them. And so that was, that was what I was doing in that work. Um, and so I, I immediately related to uh, what Janet was talking about in terms of participatory dramaturgy, because even in this mapping project, we facilitate it in such a way that we ask them what they want to see in the map. Uh, if they don't want a political map where we um, articulate this is this part and this part, we don't do it. So we ask them what they want to see. If they want to see the school, they put a marker of the school. They want to see where the waterfalls are. That's what we put in the map, not the political map, if that's what they want. If they want to see the political delineations of their villages, that's what we do. So to me, I think that is that, that is a participatory kind of dramaturgy of determining what this sculpture is going to contain and what's the meaning and interaction that they will have with it after we, le we leave this object to them, with them. Um, what was I saying? Uh, participatory dramaturgy. It's pedagogical dramaturgy because we're teaching, we're teaching them um, information about the environment uh, because this is also a, a, a collaboration with an environmental scientist. Um, and Yes, the dialogical dramaturgy because it is a, a dialogue with the, with the community and us. And I jump coming from this example, um, I would just like to uh, rewind or go back a little bit further to the session this morning. Uh, I think Hong Yan was the one who, who mentioned um, about the social relations or how um, the dramaturg is, is busy with, with that, um, with, with thinking about the social relations of the people in the room or even the people outside of the room uh, in relation to the work that is being done. And uh, what, what maybe this is, uh, what I, I was able to articulate was that um, because, because even if I do these kinds of works, I still work as an actor for like, you know, films where I just come in and I read the script and I do that. Or in traditional theaters where I just get the script and do, do what I need to do. And, and, being, and working in both uh, kinds of processes has clarified to me what, what, what I think I, my, what I do as a dramaturg. Um, or what, anyway, so. <laughs> I have, I have an image. Okay, so I, I was just thinking that um, in, in traditional modes of working, um, you have, you, you know what your roles are. Like there is, and, and those roles are kind of like uh, heuristics of relations. It's a shortcut that gives you a handle of who you are, what you are, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to be saying, and what you should be thinking about. And that heuristics of relations actually allows us to collaborate or work, kind of collaborate or work together very quickly. The director will tell me what to do and I will just think about what I'm supposed to be doing as an actor. It's an effective way of accomplishing something very quickly or if you want something that fits into that model. Um, but, you know, in a, in a more collaborative 
process, ideally, it's, you know, you, you actually break down that, that shortcut, that mental model. You come in um, with everything that you have and everybody comes in with everything that they have and you offer everything that you have, but it's not easy to understand what everything has, uh, what everyone has, you know, so, and I think that is why, why in, especially in collaborative uh, performance making, the role of a dramaturg becomes very um, about the social relations of the people involved. And it's not just the people involved, but also even the audiences, because even you know, in traditional theater, the, 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 there's also a heuristics uh, of relations there where they will sit down and they will watch, and that is something that they already know, so the dramaturg doesn't have to think about that. But if it's not that kind of performance, then the dramaturg has to think about the relations between the audience and the, the performers and things like that. So, and, and this is my last point. Um, and this is, and then I, I, I actually link this to the whole theme of the dramaturgy and the human condition because uh, it used to be that everybody knew what their role was. Everybody had, you know, if you are male and you are this, this is you. If you're a female and you're this, this is you. This is what you're supposed to do. If this is, you were born in this social class, this is what you do, this is what you can, la 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 la. Like everything was set. Um, but now that, that we are breaking down these previous notions and these previous relations, um, I, I think this is, this is the, the dramaturgy of the human condition that, that, that is also emerging or we are dealing with outside of performance. If that, if that makes any sense, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe I have some questions sure. to raise. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, just trying to connect what Ness said to this. Ken said about intercultural and the, the breakdown of, not the breakdown, but the compli complexity of globalization and movement of people and what we think is intercultural. Uh, I don't think it's so, I don't think it's so simple, you know, because uh, in the Japanese example that I gave earlier, uh, there was intercultural breakdown in one apartment building. <laughs> and it was a generational breakdown between older and the younger and people who were just put in a condominium but never spoke to each other. So there was a cultural breakdown, but it's not read as language or as whatever. So there is, you know, and then there's, in a lot of projects that I saw in Japan, a lot of the dialogical uh, dramaturgy was used because rural and urban is culturally different and they were really trying to pull young people to the rural area and so I think ideas of intercultural also need to be expanded we cannot just get locked that this is intercultural theater you know because culture is can happen anywhere la, I mean breakdown of culture but I agree with you that it becomes complex I mean, it becomes more and more complex because the conventional roles also disappear over, you know, uh, as we move very fast. So when conventions change, then the, the role of the dramaturg uh, has to be flexible. Uh, so maybe not so rigid, the, the role of the... So when you brought up your example of the, the, the project, the what do you call it? Scientific? It has a... Citizen science. Citizen science, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that it is sold as citizen science. But then because she is there, as a theatre person, you actually humanised the whole project. Which was, and you actually had a hum, human perspective to what was a very science project. 
And I, I think somebody mentioned that earlier today about the role of the dramaturg as a humanizing factor. Because really, they will just continue doing it as if it's a scientific project. And maybe the project actually needs more of this humanizing uh, role. Um, I have to defer with you where you deferred with me. <laughs> because I think I, I, I selected certain things like Arto and Breck and, and you know, a couple of other people. Uh, because that's where the intersection between me and them happened. And also I chose those examples because they intersected, I mean they were clear examples of intersection with Asian theatre forms. They're just, you know, random but uh, things that I could relate to because I did my, my studies in Asian theatre in a Western country, very weird. So, <laughs> so that's, those intersections were, uh, the reason I brought them up is not because of his uh, trying to be, trying to talk about dramaturgy historically, but because I, I just wanted to point out that actually it's got nothing to do with history. It was the, ins that means you're already in a mindset. So when an intersection happens, you kind of get a light bulb. And I think uh, watching babies or watching humans, that's how we, we learn. That's how we pluck something. And actually nothing is new. La. We just keep on getting these inspirations like she's working with her husband on this scientific project and then she just brings whatever she has to the table and then it, something happens. But it's not, I think it's that, somebody mentioned this morning about methodology. Uh, was it uh, Janice? Yeah. So actually people who look for methodology, it's a bit of an issue, <laughs> I feel. Because really it is about this, uh, this ability to create and to compose, to make sense for the parties involved, rather than a methodology of dramaturgy. I don't, I don't know whether, because the role is more important than the method, I think. Yeah, but I would like to continue to digress. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that we can, the way, the way those three examples were, were offered, it is historiography, right? And if we're going to begin talking about decolonizing the curriculum and all of these, these conversations that are particularly vibrant in Singapore this year, the way we narrate the history of theater making has, and those particular examples, right? The objectification of the Asian body in the history of theater, in those examples, I think that we need to unpack that. Um, for, for several reasons. First being that Artaud and Brecht completely misinterpreted what, what, what was going on in that space, right? Um, so I think that, yeah, no, but I, th I, th I think that this, this, this tension that we're finding here in the conversation is productive precisely because it calls it our attention to um, deal with, with this, um, the way we write the history of, of, of as you mentioned, going to a Western, Western country to study Asian theater. So I think, that, I think that, that, that we cannot just do away with that history if we're going to be serious. And the second response, very quickly before I move on, is that um, I don't think we can say that science is not human because science is a human practice. And so if we're going to be speaking about an extended dramaturgy, we should also be speaking about how science is dramaturg. Right, the processes of doing science, the processes of, of the history of science, how science is written, how science is told. We sh we, there's, there's a lot of how, how, what, 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 things to learn of that. No? And, and in, in the case of citizen science as well. And uh, my response is to the, uh, the part of ex expansion of the uh, idea of intercultural. Um, yeah, I think this is, um, this is a topic that, um, especially in the Japanese context, we really have to think about because the, um, too easily the uh, whole idea of intercultural was connected to the, uh, uh, the, 
the asset of uh, the nation state in the Japanese context. This is what actually we discussed in another um, occasion, um, this year's TPAM, um, that um, that kind of um, you know international and intercultural is still a big issue, in especially in the Japanese context. And uh, but uh, but in the uh, uh, the community-based project, we gradually started to sense that the uh, uh, the what. Janet um, uh, uh, mentioned, which is the, uh, uh, the, the dialogical you know, or the, uh, aspect between the uh, different generations, you know, the, even within the community, you know, or the, we, we started to sense that that kind of, you know, or the, uh, the differences and the diversity and also a kind of um, you know, detachment among the people is there. So the, uh, then the uh, uh, theatrical intervention, you know, or the started to make new sense in the, in the practice. So the, uh, the project I mentioned uh, in my presentation, the Stories of Community, started 20 years ago. And uh, it was a project that collect the, uh, uh, the anecdotes, you know, the uh, episodes from their community, and they just try to reimagine the, uh, their community. They try to tap on the history of the community. But now it's more dialogical. You know, or the, this is more about talking about themselves, you know, exchanging the idea about their, you know, their ideas on the relationship. So the, uh, it, it is under the same batch, it is under the same title, and the uh, basic structure is the same, but the fundamental, you know, or the meaning and the uh, relationship with the, uh, the society has totally, you know, or the altered. You know, the, uh, it has been changed in many different ways. So I think, uh, I think that uh, that's why the role of the person who can mediate you know, or the, uh, these gaps, who can fill these gaps is very important. It is not ne necessarily, you know, that we involved the, uh, the Singaporean participants, you know, that uh, we needed that gap fillers. But yeah, we also, the, uh, we needed the kind of uh, the laws um, in that process. So, the, uh, so, going so, the, so that's how I could relate the, uh, the practice back to the uh, Janet's point. audience because uh, when this is an interesting experience when I was in university who's met, who, who you mentioned about media media education when I was in university uh, advertisers adver, adver, people who wrote advertisements and made news had a lot of control uh, over and that was the time when universities opened a media department in Malaysia and when that media department was opened uh, instead of teaching people how to make media, many of them were actually activists who were lecturing. So what they did was teach everybody how to deconstruct media. And they had like big workshops and conferences and that particular period in history, we normal, normal students like me like were like, huh? You mean all that had to be deconstructed? Uh, it's something like social media has to be deconstructed now, but at that time was was advertisements and newspapers and but it never left my body. You know that that workshop just because it was workshopped, we were asked to deconstruct the media. So my question to the audience is, what happens if you are the dramaturg, if you're actually taught dramaturgy? So going back to what Janice. Uh, mention what because Janice was actually where's Janice? Oh hi, <laughs> she's actually you know because we see it as it's in university and you're teaching somebody about dramaturgy, but actually her assignments are actually allowing the students to become dramaturgs. It's a very active, action oriented uh, assignment, and I'm very curious that if you had the power 
to actually practice dramaturgy. Uh, and there are a couple of students here, so Charlene, uh, <laughs> and others. So they were both like 13 year olds in the process. I mean, when we were experimenting with this idea of can you allow children to actually start the dramaturgical process? And, you know, does, is, it an emancip is, it, is it a way to emancipate, you know? Um, I'm Robin. Just two things I think we need to clarify that, um, and I've been going on about this since the first ADN symposium, that there is a fundamental difference between dramaturgy and a dramaturg. The dramaturgy can be taught simply because David Pleasure calls it the operating system, um, I think Shankar and I, we shared the same thing that a dramaturg is actually a structural engineer, not the architect. So it's something that is about flow, it's something about movement, something about the mechanics of a text, which of course you can teach, either through a literary text or through performance analysis. You can teach that. So that can be. So you can actually teach dramaturgy. A dramaturg does more than just look after dramaturgy. Right? That's one of the things that a dramaturg does. A dramaturg does mediating, a dramaturg does diplomating, a diplomacy does um, <clears throat> all sorts of different things. So whether you, the, the, the teaching of dramaturgy as a science or as an art or as a practice, I think that can be taught and I can set assignments to test whether this person has knowledge of what is dramaturgical and what are the dramaturgical operations. But I think the role of a dramaturg, which Janet, you actually said that it's more complex because the role is more important than the practices, is something that need, literally can, needs to be put into practice and needs to go through a particular time uh, of actually being on the job. Yeah, so I think then if we, because it's, it's, it's just commonsensical, dramaturg, dramaturgy, a dramaturg does dramaturgy, so if dramaturgy is this and dramaturgy, it's not as that. So I think then that's why it's, the ADN is called the Adrian Dramaturgs Network, not a dramaturgy network. And what is also considered dramaturgical is also fairly complex and specific in discussion contexts. So I think, I think that, that needs, I just feel that that needs to be clarified, right, in terms of then what can be acquired, what can be taught, what can be learned, and what can be practiced. Yeah, that's all. Maybe just to play that tune, just a thought that sprung to mind a few minutes ago is that uh, maybe, maybe there's something of managing intersections in the practice of dramaturgy, right? Um, and I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to use manager because I suspect that many here will go like, eh, a manager. Um, more intersectional management can be a need, right? Because, because and, it, and it's, it's multiple intersections, no, not only identity, but also as Jan, as, as Janet was saying, um, conceiving of culture beyond race and nation, but also, you know, Mark was speaking of disability and etc. Was it you, Mark? It was you, right? Disability in the morning? Deaf yes. theater? Yeah, right? Uh, so I think that there, there can be something there about... I mean, intersection is, 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 a, is a tricky concept, right? The moment you think you understood it, it escapes because in, it's ephemeral. It's in the nature of the concept, is it's, in, in, it's impossibility, right? So there's this tension in, in being a, a dramaturg of managing intersections when intersections are always mobile and fluid and on the go. And so in that sense, your point on not having a, defin, a, 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 a one methodology can be, that's something, just a thought, put it in here. I think it's important to say this because there seems to be a lot of lecturers in the room, so... 
I just want to say that um, I agree that there is a problem in the way that we are taught uh, theatre history or performance history in the sense that it's really Eurocentric, especially in a place like India where there is so many other traditions that are actually written. Because one of the issues with how pedagogy is constructed is like you privilege the written word over the oral. So I would understand why a lot of Western um, universities would rely on that, but as Asian cultures that have uh, all of this within our cultures, I think there needs to be a shift and it doesn't mean just bringing a YouTube video to class one day, right? Or to bring a guest lecturer to do that one lecture where the oral history is brought into the classroom. So I think that, and I'm sure that a lot of lecturers in this room are pushing ways in which the curriculum can be decolonized and I hope that more people do that. Uh, one of my comments is about uh, what you said about the non-human. So this was a conversation that I was having with Charlene as well, where one of the uh, tradition, uh, traditional practices which you showed, which is the wailing and the healing uh, ritual. This is also something that a lot of uh, lowered caste communities in India do. And what is interesting about that is uh, it has been used as a technique to uh, push really the boundaries of what can be said, what utterances are allowed and what are disallowed. So for Dalit women, for example, that is a space where you can uh, yell at the upper caste landlord. You can abuse, uh, you know, the crap out of him. Or, uh, you know, you can beat up your husband, uh, you know, while you're being possessed because you have entered a realm where your uh, all rules break down, right? So um, I think that it's important to see these kind of traditions as, also, uh, as more human rather than subhuman because, uh, or superhuman. Uh, I think uh, the elevated consciousness does not necessarily mean that it's taken to a non-human level. And in, in that sense, what exactly is uh, a non-human uh, object, you know, technology is as human as uh, it comes, the weather is human, uh, time is human, so what, what really is non-human? How do we make the distinction between human and non-human? That's a response to what uh, Felipe said. And um, it's interesting that you uh, spoke about the dramaturgy of the newsroom. Um, of course, uh, it's not surprising. I think the most Asian thing that you have done is mention your family. So I think you're undoubtedly <laughs> Asian. Um, but I think that it's interesting uh, because it made me think of um, Saddam Hussein's death and how that was dramaturgically staged for uh, the world to view and the events that uh, preceded that and also succeeded that because uh, as you know, the staging of that was very specific and had a lot of repercussions. Um, my question to Ness would be, you have used maps as a kind of device, uh, but uh, the history of uh, maps being used is mostly a, in a colonial context as um, for exploratory and colonizing tendencies. So how did um, you using the device of a map within an indigenous community, like what were their responses to how it has been used historically? And of course, I agree with Ken that uh, collaborations are not devoid of power. And this is also something that I was talking to Charlene about uh, during the break that uh, we should focus more on being rigorously ethical in the work that we do, whether they're collaborations or not, rather than be really carried away by the politically correct ways of doing things or saying things. So I think rigorous ethics has to replace the wokeness of most of our spaces. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, well, I, I would disagree that the weather is human. Um, yeah, I mean, in that sense, of course, it is. But it is, yeah. In, in any case, we can, we can just refer to the weather or the Anthropocene or the current planetary state uh, relationally and with the human agency as perhaps the definitory agency at this point of history of deep history of geological history, but I, w I would have limitations or reservations of s in saying that the weather is human. Um, and of course, we can make a quick literature review about non-human, post-human, etc. But um, maybe just to keep the tone a bit lo lower and not going like high theoretical dance and people falling asleep moments, um, perhaps a good way to 
assess what, what is human and not, uh, what is the limit between humanity and non-humanity is agency. Um, so if you think of algorithms, for example, right, obviously they are designed by a human agency, but there is an entire algorithmic arena of actions that are completely outside of human agency. Right? Even though they are co connected to the human world, they are non-human. Right? Uh, weather in, on the moon is non-human. Right? Not because we go to the moon, the moon begins to be any more human than we are, or that, that it was before, sorry. Right? So I think that there is a border there. We need to begin thinking about it. Um, the, the, the modernistic division between the world and humanity, I think that that's one, one problem here, especially if we're talking about shamanic practices, right? The dominion or the agency or the capacity to dominate the world uh, not only has, has a colonial epistemology into it, but it's problematic when we're trying to decipher the limits of the human condition vis-a-vis vis -vis an algorithmic reality and ecological precarity, right? So there's an, there's, there, there are limits that we need to begin discussing. And while I, I understand the romantic sense of humanism of trying to bring back some sort of uh, ethics and compassion, I think that we should also be uh, very careful with how we posit ourselves as humans in the 21st century. We, I mean, the sustainability of that, of that notion is no longer uh, able to, just to, to, to be carried forward in the short term, right? Like we're speaking about human limits in 30 years, right? So I think that we need to be, to be addressing this at all levels in, dramat in dramaturgy also as well. Um, yeah, that's, thank you for bringing that up because I was thinking of putting that in my spiel, but yeah. Um, definitely we, we had a lot of dialogue with the community to ask if they really did want a map to begin with and if it will be useful for them. Um, and so they agreed. Um, and uh, one of the tricky things that we've had to navigate around that project is that we had to partner with the local government because we can't just go to the community directly. We had to go through them. Um, and of course, they had their own agenda why they were allowing us to do the map. Um, our entry point was to say that we are doing this for disaster education, so it's the safest um, agenda. So we're doing it for disaster education, so it's a map that when you see the three-dimensional map, you will understand where landslides can come and where the tsunami will hit um, because it was a coastal community um, that was also near the mountains. So, um, but. Uh, for example, the, the local government wanted um, the land use plan to be reflected in the map, like the future uh, plans. So like they wanted to build roads in certain places, they wanted dams to be built in certain places, and they wanted to reflect that in the map. Um, while the local community had a different um, understanding of that place they had different, literally different lines that they wanted to draw because their lines were about, this place is full of certain kinds of trees and this is where we do our uh, slash and burn practices in this part and this is where. So it's like really like two different informations that they wanted. Um, but then ultimately because um, the map was for the community and they were the ones who were making it, so we followed um, the data that they wanted to be seen uh, in there and not the one with the local government. The work around is that we made, uh, the project also has a light-based element, kind of like a shadow play, where you can put in like a slide of another type of data. So we've made the, we made the acetate slide of the land use, which they can put there, uh, but it's not a permanent thing. But it was a good thing because actually the, the locals did not know that that was the land use plan of the local government for the next few years. So at least they were able to see that and now, now there's more information uh, regarding that. But it's really, really, really tricky 
um, like even like where the map will stay, who has access to that map, because you will see a lot of information about the place. Um, but ultimately, it, it, the, the chieftains are the ones who hold the map, and it is in their um, kind of like their, their hall, and that is where uh, that map is. Yeah, this story actually really reminds me that, you know, a kind of struggle that um, the uh, kind of ethical, you know, the question we have to uh, deal with when we planned the, uh, this community-based um, exchange program because that um, the, uh, our intention was just to set the ground for the, uh, to talk about the uh, issues related to family you know, or the, um, all the uh, solidarity, you know, the, uh, in, in the society or something like that. And uh, through the exchange of the letters between Japan, Japan and, uh, Japanese and the Singaporean participants, so that yeah, their personal stories will be shared. And the, uh, of course, you know, that we had a lot of uh, ethical questions, how these, you know, or the, uh, the personal stories should be treated and how, you know, that we deal with that kind of, you know, or the, a very, very, personal or even traumatic experience should be treated and uh, you know the, uh, the used as a material in, in the process this is another one layer of the ethical consideration but yeah on top of that when we contextualize this project to the, uh, uh, the our funding body which was the Asia the Japan Foundation Nature Center which was set up for the uh, uh, for the cultural you know exchange you know the, uh, in preparation to the uh, uh, the 2020 Olympic Games by the Japanese government so the how these you know that this project the, uh, contribute to the Japanese you know or the national desire to take a lead you know take an initiative in 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 the uh, in the region you know to um, to portray itself. You know, the, in the, uh, the national, you know, huge, you know, the social, social political situ the, uh, situation uh, towards the, uh, this uh, Olympic Games. So the, uh, this is another ethical question we have to ask, you know, the how much we, sh and how uh, shall we, you know, the portray this project um, when we propose to the, uh, the Japan Foundation. Asia Center, the, uh, the funding body, which was another layer we had to consider. This is one of the reasons why I raised that question this morning about uh, what, is there a meta dramaturgy going on? <laughs> is there, I mean, seriously, even, even the performative act of mapping, because participatory mapping is actually contra to colonial maps where people already give you the map. So participatory mapping, I, I'm a mapper myself. I specialize in what is called cultural mapping. And the purpose of this kind of mapping is to, to, to give the power of mapping to the, to the you know, people. But actually, I feel every time I'm doing that, so I kind of do cultural mapping and a husband does scientific whatever mapping. <laughs> so. The, the role of the mediator that Ken is talking about, this, this dramaturg who has to kind of play a mediatory role between two stakeholders who have really different agenda. And sometimes when you're doing it with the people, so you have like government with their agenda of what a map actually should have, this is what you should have in it. In it. And then you have the people who are actually been invited to make the map and they have their own uh, view of what land use and, and what is significant to them culturally or politically is completely different from what the government wants. So the role of that, the mediator or the dramaturg there may not be clear to you, but actually it is a meta dramaturgy that is going on. And I think dramaturgy, the dramaturg uh, Robin asked about what is really the role of this dramaturg at the meta level. I think we need to look at both the levels, dramaturgy as the immediate you know, shaping and then this meta dramaturgy, which is actually handling a conflict between two parties. I, I would all, only add to that that we should be careful not to add meta layers. Um, and I, I guess that this goes back this is what I was trying to articulate in my first interjection, was that 
we should, like in mapping the, the dramaturg and dramaturgy as this transcendental transcultural practice, right, we risk failing to see that the dramaturg and her practice are embedded into a context that it's imminent, right? There is no big master dramaturg unless you are you're super pious in any particular religion, which in my case I am not, so I don't believe in, which, in, in an ultimate meta dramaturg controlling the universe, right? I believe that the universe creates itself and I am part of the universe, right? I, I went all the way meta, right? <laughs> But just to say that I think that we just need to be very specific. Uh, if we're going to be adding layers of meta dramaturgy, we're, we're almost entering a theological terrain, right? We will soon realize that we're speaking about this big designer that has a pre-designed structure, as Robin mentioned. Whereas what I'm thinking, at least from my perspective as an atheist, is that uh, the performativity in which the dramaturg appears, right, needs to be understood imminently, not transcendentally, right? Otherwise, otherwise, we risk just assuming that there is one big notion, one big idea of dramaturgy in the world, in the Platonistic sense, right? And I, I don't think that's quite it. I think the practice of dramaturgy is embedded and it needs to be materially understood in the context in which it is practiced. Uh, just one last note. I, I just want to draw you back to what actually Janet was talking about and perhaps the word matter as, as a suggestion, uh, going back to Janet's one, when she talked about smaller dramaturgy and larger dramaturgy, perhaps this matter that we've been talking about is really about the big picture, right? And this smaller one is when, say, Ness is literally on ground doing, but Ness has to still look at the big picture of why are we doing this map, as opposed to, okay, now we have to consider the border on the map, but then at the back, the larger picture is why is this border necessary, right? Rather than going to the meta meta, which is true, then it becomes transcendental where, because I did have a question just now when we were talking about meta meta and everything else, that one of the early discussions of ADN in its multiple panels was that dramaturgy exists in the work, is embedded in the work. And sometimes the job of the dramaturg is to unearth to a certain degree, to sift through what is there first, through questioning, through probing, right? Uh, we have come to this mapping now, but then even in your earlier in your keynote, there is a lot of unnerving. And I, I think intersection is another problematic word here. For me, maybe perhaps what you were trying to do with drawing examples, the so-called local Asian examples, to what was happening with some of these definitions and, and uh, key terms is to unearth what we are doing here to find some kind of parallels rather than intersection, I think. Uh, this is just a bit of my thought, but I'd like to now open it up again to the floor if we have questions. I think Chui Yin has a question. Hi, we have a question over there. Mike, please. Hi. Um, actually, it's more of a reiteration or one of, question, one of the questions that Felipe brought up, which was about who is allowed to be a dramaturg. And I mean, I'm hearing well, uh, a lot of stuff, um, but um, one of the words that kind of keeps popping up in my mind that um, hasn't really quite been articulated from what I've heard is the question of subjectivity and how each individual dramaturg or practice of dramaturgy in any specific context or project manifests as a particular result of your subjectivities. Um, and so Felipe's response to what Janet's choice of sharing of the order of examples is subject to his pers perspective, but also Janet's choice is, you know, because that was her route into this. So, I mean, I, 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 I just wanted to bring up the question of subjectivity because maybe I thought it might be interesting to hear from each of you how you think the role of the dramaturg 
um, zooming in to yourself, negotiate your own subjectivities, how much space in your own process do you scope out to contest your own subjectivities or account for them um, to your, the people you work with in a project. Um, and then linking it to Felipe's question about then who gets to be a dramaturg. Um, that could be a political intersectional question or just about maybe if you're very like, you know, emotionally dense, you cannot be a dramaturg, for example. Like, yeah. As in, it, it, may, it may not be an identity thing, it might just be an emotional maturity thing, it might just be a, you know, yeah, open to answers. would like to start first or the response we have is that is it a uh, response to the the no it's not a response it's another point it's another point as it, an add-on question if it's yes. not then I, I like to just hold on to that and we want to tackle that immediately because usually it just gets yeah lost in the ether right in a way it's a response in a way okay then uh, my request <laughs> is to keep it short yes it's it's very short I'm older than everyone in the room, and I worked in the theater <clears throat> for more than 50 years, and the first 35 years, there was no such word, at least in the American English language, as dramaturg. So what happened? How did all this theater manage to be for so many years without identifying who should be or who can be the dramaturg? And don't we think there always was a dramaturg, but they just weren't told dramaturg? Yeah, that's an ongoing question that we've been having since 2016 when we are, and we're still doing it now because we're talking about the figure, the concept, the activity, the verb, the noun, right? Uh, does anybody have any, yeah, immediate response to Shreen's statement, subjectivity, those who, yes, please, Charlene. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a response to Shreen's comment, but it was also percolating in my head earlier, which is that when we're looking at terminologies that are floating around, uh, two others come to mind when I was listening to the discussion. Uh, that is of the facilitator and of the intermediary. And how these kinds of spaces or these kinds of roles and therefore subjectivities of sorts have begun to inform ways in which projects are actually conceptualized and developed with the view to having such so-called persons in place, or they evolve with the un, uh, aware, uh, growing awareness that, oh, maybe the next time there's a need for such roles to inform the way in which the subject, uh, the project develops. Um, because I think that that percolation of different ways in which the role can fill the gaps or provide the context is part of a, uh, a political choice, actually, about how the power is going to get distributed, developed, reworked, contested, uh, interrogated, and so on and so forth. So it, it connects then to me about what kinds of questions are allowed to inform that kind of process, but also how little or large those questions are likely to be uh, in the little and large dramaturgies because very often the pressures of time take you away from the big questions and keep you kind of rushing towards just fulfilling some of some of the smaller questions right and so the the role of or the position of the intermediary facilitator dramaturg etc pengganggu the disturber was one of the terms that came up earlier and seemed to have a lot of resonance is to actually maybe disturb everything and keep kind of going back to, or going forwards to questions that are not going to settle the project, but unsettle the project. You know, and, and I think that's part of the liberty that these roles can have sometimes, which we often forget. Because often the, the hyper-responsible or hyper-control freak will want to figure things out neatly and settle them. Because that's a power trip as well, I think. 
I mean, reflecting on my own practice, um, there is a power trip that's involved, particularly as an educator, I know that, right? You want to fix it and make it sound good and, and then feel the satisfaction of, hey, yeah, you know, I winged it or I wung it, <laughs> if there's a <laughs> past tense of winging it. Um, but then again, there is insufficient political will or space, I think, to keep someone in the room or in the project who is there to unsettle and disturb and disrupt and, and play the provocateur in that sense, right? There's the animateur, but there's also the provocateur who then has the long-term uh, view to keep that kind of question going. And maybe that's a kind of more meta perspective. So that's a kind of a question and a response rolled into three and a half. Anyone here would like to respond to Chuyin, yeah, Shalin? Just very quickly to Chuyin, I think that in terms of subjectivity, so I don't have a dramaturgical practice, uh, but in the last, so I think that thinking about subjectivity, I can speak about Miss British a bit because in that process, I worked much more as a dramaturg than as a director per se. And I would say that it is an, an example of how my subjectivity impeded much of the work, right? Um, I mean, it was a very traumatic process by all means, uh, but precisely it was traumatic because my subjectivity was not very well defined in the rehearsal room, right? Uh, visibly, I was taken as a, as, as a white male, and the, 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 Mex the Mexican idiosyncrasies or the, Mex the Mexican colonial wounds that I was trying to bring into the work were completely eliminated, right? It, was, it, it, it got to a point of hostility. Um, so I think that, I think that you, you, you touch on a, on a point that is really interesting, uh, and perhaps we should speak of the subjectivity of the dramaturg as an enabler, but also as a disabler, right? Um, for either bo positive or negative consequences. Okay. Um, I suppose that you know there are, of course, several kinds of dramaturgs, and also the, some dram the, each dramaturg has his or her own, you know, or the purpose and the aim and the ambition, maybe. So the. Uh, I encountered one situation in, in Japan that, you know, that when I, I tried to credit myself as a dramaturg, a uh, producer stopped me because there was no, uh, uh, the, the grant scheme that they got funding didn't allow the, to pay for, for such a person called dramaturg. So, the, uh, so the, he asked me to uh, the, um, the, uh, think, of, think of other title. <laughs> and uh, I thought, okay. And, uh, and I didn't care actually, you know, that, uh, because the uh, role I, I played was already, you know, or the shared by the, uh, by the people who did it. But yeah, there are some dramaturgs who really working hard, trying hard to establish dramaturg as a kind of a profession, you know, and to occupy a certain position in the theater making. So I think this is one kind of dramaturg, but I'm not. So the, uh, for me, the, um, the, uh, as I mentioned in my response, the, you know, for me, the uh, making the uh, theater a kind of uh, um, heteroglossia is a, a very, very purpose for me to get involved in the, in, in the process. And uh, uh, to make, make it happen, the dissolving the hi hierarchy in the theater making process is a key for me. So the, for me, the, uh, destroying the hierarchy is always a big problem, the, a big issue to tackle. And uh, there was one project I tried to do a, a kind of collaborative translation you know, or the, uh, with the, uh, the director and the performers. My idea was that you know, the translator is usually taking a very privileged position because his or her interpretation is the base, becomes the basis of the further development in the target language. So the, I wanted to open up this process you know, uh, to the, uh, the directors and the, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, collaborative performers as well. So it was my intention, and uh, uh, I tried to 
you know, or the, uh, create the kind of environment to destroy the hierarchy and uh, uh, to let the, uh, the people communicate you know, or the, uh, in, the, in that um, sphere so that the heterogrossia will come up. So for me, this is the purpose and this is, the, uh, uh, this is what I, I'm doing. And uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to be a dramaturg, but yeah, I, do be, I do know that there are some theater makers who want to set up that kind of situation and uh, uh, there has to be somebody who do that kind, who set up that kind of ground. And uh, I took that position. And uh, whatever it is called, I'm happy with that. Um, I'm afraid that my answer might be too simple, but um, to me, uh, when talking about subjectivity, I. Yes, I think about it a lot. I embrace it a lot when I when I am in a position of uh, as a dramaturg or doing uh, collaborative uh, work, even if I'm not called the dramaturg, but I'm thinking of the dramaturgical process um, because my my background uh, as a performance maker is mainly as an actor, and as an actor. Um, I, en I enjoy that a lot, but in that process, I am trying to erase, um, you know, myself. I'm working very, very hard to become someone else so that I can, you know, empathize with that. I try to empathize with that character and become that character and, you know, um, yeah, th do that. And so what I enjoy about um, doing dramaturgical work or being a dramaturg in a... In a, in a work is that I can put in my own subjectivity more, it allows me to do that more than when I am an actor. I can also do that as an actor, but very slyly, I have to think about it, you know, very much like how am I going to change the tone of this line or whatever, but, you know, um, I have a lot more agency, I think, uh, to, to include my subjectivity uh, when I do my work as a dramaturg. Um, this word subjectivity and objectivity, I don't know how it got into the <laughs> dramaturgical, uh, you know, like you have to be objective to be a dramaturg, dramaturg or something like that. Because I, I think uh, I'm very subjective when I'm a dramaturg at a certain point. And then when I have to switch to the spectator, I have to practice a lot of sub, uh, objectivity. That means I have to like get into the spectator's mind. And this I had to do a lot when I was working with communities which are not from my culture. So earlier my works were more like in-group, you know what I mean? Audiences were more in-group. But when I started the heritage work and working in spaces that were not my, my home space, I really had to do this kind of major uh, shift. So I have to hold, so I have like some agenda and some, you know, activist kind of intention, but then I, when, the minute I know that this is going to be performed to a particular audience, then I have, I got no choice. Because otherwise it's not going to uh, get through. So sometimes you have to like do this back and forth. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I do need to say something about this objectivity and subjectivity too, because I realize that I'm complicit to it. Uh, in trying to strike out a relationship with the, the artists I'm working with, yeah, we will always say, oh, as dramaturg, I'm here to serve the work. And it was something that uh, a few of my other fellow dramaturgs, I believe, that, and, I, and I believed in that too. But I don't think I believe in that any longer. It's bullshit, actually. And I think we tell people that, yeah, we are always neutral because we are the, the outside eye, we remain neutral, la la la, and all that. Uh, 
personally now I say, if you remain so neutral, how are you invested in the work to make the work better? It's, it's starting to happen. The last few year, uh, projects I've done is like, I am passionate about the work. I just have to be aware that there is an ongoing discussion and collaboration between the artist and me, and I'm asking the right questions to the artist. For instance, what do you want to do now? And how are you going to do it, for instance? So, uh, yeah, I'm beginning to think that this thing about objectivity came about because there was, there was a bit of, for me, personally, it was trying to explain myself to the role of the dramaturg because there was a, a very huge response in the beginning, a few years ago, the, with the initial introduction of the role of the dramaturg, the role of the dramaturg, not the concept of dramaturgy, the role of the dramaturg risking or in danger of hijacking the artist's work. I, th I think I have to be honest with myself and say that now. So there was a defense mechanism. No, we're here to look at this from a neutral point of blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting here now telling you this for the first time. That's bullshit. There has to be some kind of subjectivity involved, I think. On that note, well, actually, there was a chime already. Time is up, I'm afraid. Uh, it has been actually quite extensive how it all literally mapped out, folded out. Uh, we went to many, many other places and realms within dramaturgy and the dramaturg. Um, there's one last thing that I would like to address, which is that this was actually, I think when Charlene conceived this uh, two-day session, it was about talking about the figure of the dramaturg and dramaturg as the person. Uh, we're still not seeing the person to a certain degree. I was just uh, telling Janet, Janet, I said, your keynote is very good. You just talk about dramaturgy, even though these are actually something that you have experienced firsthand. You talked about yourself in third person, actually. Just to end on that note, I'd like to please help me to thank Janet Pillay, <laughs> Felipe Severa, Ken Takiguchi, Nessa Rowe.